I come from, my name is Barbara Simler. I come from Poland, from a small town called Aleksandrów Kujawski, which was not far from the German border. And that was, unfortunately, we were hit straight away in 1939, because they started evacuating. As soon as the Germans came in, they started evacuating the poor Jewish people. And my father got frightened, they will be we will be next. So he got a cart and a horse, loaded up and went into the middle of Poland where his brother was living. There we stayed till Christmas. Then there were placards that the, all the people who are not um, residents of Lubranis must live within 24 hours. So, and that was winter already, and winters in Poland are very, very strong, very cold. So he hired a, a slate with a driver, we loaded it up, and we were going through t towards Warsaw. We stopped in a town called Kutno, where Polish family whom we knew from Alexandrov, because their daughter was my friend, were living there, they took us in. They took us in when my father got to know what's happening already in Warsaw, so he didn't want to, we didn't want to go. We stayed with the Polish family for six weeks, but after six weeks the neighbor came and um, said that we are endangering lives of the Lebedzinskis because they're hiding Jewish people. So my father went into Kutno town and um, found a place on the right hand side when he crossed the railway track on the right hand side there were shops and one name was Kronzilber so my father understood they must be Jewish people and we went there. He went there and they took us in. We stayed there till a lot of things happened there, which I'm not going to discuss my, which was very terrible to me. I'm not going to discuss this, but we stayed there till about May, and in May um, they came and they were arresting the most, all the prominent Jews in Kutno. Kronzilber were prominent, they were quite comfortable people. They took them and they took us with them. They kept us for 14, 14 days in a tobacco factory where they was not in use since the First World War. And they put us in. From there, there we were 200 people. I have to concentrate a bit. There were 200 people there and um, we stayed there for a fortnight it was terrible things happening there my father was a stout man we were lying on the straw there we only had soup and during the day piece of bread in the morning piece of bread in the after, in the evening and my father we were lying on straw and as six assessments came and they told my father to get up to undress himself from one side three assessment, from the other side three assessment, they're pushing from one like a ball from one to another. And then they took a gun and myself and my mother thought, oh my God, they're going to kill him. But they didn't, they just shot the gun near the, the, near the ear just to bamboozle him and they throw him back on the, on the straw. Then, two days later, they come and they called them as some name. And the man was a jeweler, jeweler and he asked, this, the assessment asked, where is the jewelry? What well, that soldier left there? So the man said, I don't know, you took everything away. And because he accused them of thieves, then they took the gun and shot him in front of us. It was a terrible experience. After that, they woke us up in the night and we were marching into outside Kutno, which was a um, 
sugar factory, which was also not in use. People from Kutna was already there. I don't know, seven, seven uh, hundred, uh, seven hundred, not million, seven hundred people or eight hundred, I don't know, the whole Kutna was there. They were allowed to bring all, all sorts of things. We were absolutely, they took everything away from us. We didn't have nothing. But they shared a bed with us and some bedding. That was terrible there. Really terrible. No food was coming in. People were starving, lying already on the ground. It was terrible. One, my, when Germans used to come to a, a town, they used to choose Juden Elteste. What does it mean they had been in contact for the, with a few, three, four Jews from every town? What work the Jewish people should do? And my uncle in Lubranitz was chosen as a Juden Elteste. Well, <coughs> excuse me, when he got to know what's happening to us, and he was in contact with the Germans, and they they gave him a letter with a gendarme to get us out from Kutno Ghetto. And that's how I, we got out from Kutno Ghetto. And I think I'm the only one who was there is alive. Because my mother's brother with four sons was there. My cousin, my mother's cousin was with, was with the wife and a son and a daughter, they all went. All went, nobody alive. And I think I'm the only one who was there. Because we got my, one of my mother's cousin's son was a doctor and he was the only one who was still alive from my mother's family because my mother's family, the whole disappeared. Sisters, brother, cousins, everybody disappeared. I actually didn't mention I was the only one child. I didn't have no brothers or sisters. And that cousin, David Jakubowski, Jakubowski, when he got to know that I'm alive, he got in touch with me and I told him where I met his parents and all this. And he wrote to Germany and they told him that all the people from Kutno Ghetto vanished. They, they were put in. Loris and they were guests in Loris. And that was the beginning. Look, I can sit here and walk to talk to about the whole hour. So what do you want me to do? Talk more? Anyway, from there, the gendarmes took us right up to my uncle's place. My father, my mother and me. When they had the permission to get us out from the Kutno ghetto. <coughs> There was not too bad, but of course we had to walk on the middle of the road. We had to wear uh, yellow stars on front of our garments and the back of our garments. And um, it was not, too, we were not hungry and not cold yet. Till March, that was 1941, placards, all the men have to assemble in the marketplace. So my father, his brother, and his two sons, they all went to the marketplace, and I never saw my father again. It was finished. A few, few months later, it was June or July, it was warm already. All the women have to assemble in, in the marketplace. So we all went, took little passes, and we went, because we knew we were not coming back anymore and they sent us to Lodge Ghetto. When we got into the ghetto, my mother was absolutely devastated. When my father was away, she was becoming like a baby. It was terrible. I had, I was that time 13 years old. It was shocking. Anyway, two women were there in white overcoats on the platform in Lodge Ghetto when we arrived. And somebody told me that they're looking for a, people to work in a hospital, children's hospital. So I went over to them and I begged them to give me jobs. So she said, the child will look after a child. 
But I said, I have no money. My father was taken away. We are already fighting since 1939. We had to leave our home in 1939. It's impossible. She thought they were feeling sorry for me. And they thought, okay, come next day. When next day, ah, when they arrived in the ghetto, there were special committees to assemble you where you're going to stay, with whom you're going to stay. So we were assembled to, it was one room, and it was a young man with a mother. It was very difficult for me, because with one young man, and it was very difficult. But I got the job. I was lucky. I got the job, because if you didn't work in the ghetto, you didn't get token for the food. So, I was, um, uh, we ha I had like a uniform, a, a old, big overall with a little cap that I'm working in the hospital, which was very helpful to me because I could move around in the ghetto any time and in the evening, in the, in the evening and in the day. Anyway. So, there were two blocks facing each other. In one block was children with tuberculosis and in one block with boys. And of course, I was working with the boys. I was not the nurse, but cleaning, washing them, helping to feed them and all this. They are children who are already orphans, that the parents already were gone. When you got into the ghetto, you could see people lying on the streets, children begging for food, dying from starvation. It was terrible. Terrible. Anyway, one day, two lorries came to the hospital and they start taking all the children away to the lorries. The children didn't want to go. They were crying, hiding behind ourselves. I was scared they should take me with, because already my mother was already lying ill. She was already paralyzed on one side. She had terrible pain on the side of her body. They took her to hospital, and they start pulling her leg with some, I don't know what, and they sent her back to me paralyzed. And that was terrible. Before they finished with the hospital, there were again plaques, that, not plaques, we got to know that they're going to raid the street I'm, I am living in. They come and taking people away. So I was afraid that they would take my mother away while I'm going to work. So I should carry her on my, on my, in my hands, my arms, and put, the, put her in a ditch in the garden, covered up with, with grass, put it first, uh, like a rack on her, and went to work hoping that when I come back, she'd be there. She was there. But, as I said, we couldn't work for a long time there. It happened again when they closed in the street but I couldn't carry her anymore because I didn't have the strength anymore. So I just left her. She spoke very well German. So I said, Mama, tell them that you are, that your daughter went to collect the ambulance. And they left her. Life in the ghetto was terrible with my mother. I, I cannot express to anybody. I didn't get a token for her. I had to share with her my food, because in the, in the end, when they took this close the children's hospital, I didn't have no work either, but I got a job in a, a knitting factory, because at school I was learning how to knit and all this, so we're knitting. In the ghetto we we're working only for the Germans. We used to make all the uniforms for the soldiers, hats, shoes, everything. And knitting sweaters and t and and uh, socks, and that's what I could do. But as one, I was not the only one who was in trouble with somebody's ill in the family that they have to put in token to get food. You see, 
a lot of Jewish men were working for the Germans direct. So their wives, they had to figure that they're working and they had to produce the work. And like me and other girls like me who needed a token working for them, but we had to do it in the night to do the work. So we are cheating a bit and in the factory we are doing a little bit as well and one girl got caught. One girl got caught and they took our soup away. Because why are you working to get a soup during the... So we struck. They were not going to work if you don't give the girl the soup. So they didn't care. Police came and arrested us. Jewish police. Everything was Jewish. The ghetto was everything Jewish. They arrested us and put us in jail. So, in jail, I went over in the evening to the officer. I asked if he, I can speak to him, and I told him my position. Then my mother is lying there, and if I don't go home, she'll just starve. Because you see, before I went, I used to take, put two chairs away next to her, one with a bed pin and one with some food, whatever I had. The food was peeled potatoes, mashed it up, and on this, on this thing, do the cutlets, and that was our food. So I used to give that this food, and that's it. So he, 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 he let me have an officer, a, a policeman, took me home, helped me even to chop the wood to cut, to do some food for my mother. And I went to the neighbor next door, I said, I told him what happened. Can you give some drink for my mother? I can't expect them to give any food because they didn't have themselves. And I said to my mother, Mama, don't worry, I'll be tomorrow home. I have to do some work in the night. I didn't want to worry her that I was arrested. And from there, the next day, we were very lucky that the roll commando didn't come to the jail and took us away. But the next morning they woke us up put us again in fives and took us, it is in the ghetto, but outside like town. There were also two big uh, uh, b b um, blocks. We were doing something for the Germans, but we don't, I don't know, we were, we were putting together something and then it had to be packed, put it in boxes. And the assessment was staying in the end, checking if everything is there in order. And that's what my work was. I went to the director there and asked him if he could help me. I told him my story about my mother, that I have no food for her, and he allowed me to give a soup for her. And during lunchtime, I was taking the soup to my mother. And that till lasted till about 43, I don't know, June, July, I don't remember what month. Um, evacuated. On Sunday they never evacuated. So I went next door because the people who were living to me next door, they were already gone. Took some flour there, put with, some, with water and put in the oven to make like a little bread or whatever. Just putting in there, two assessments stood in the door, and to me, rouse, 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 taking, taking me away. And I, I did not know what to do. I was afraid to go to my mother to say goodbye to her and to cuddle her and to give her a kiss or all this, because I didn't want to see what they're going to do in front of my eyes to my mother. So I stood in the door and I said, Mama, God should be with us. And I went and left her there. Anyway, they took me to a, a, outside the ghetto. They were already the, the wagons for animals. How do you call it? Cattle. Cattle trains. We were about 100, 120 
people into one wagon. We like sardines. In the middle we had uh, water with barrel with water. And when the train was going, the barrel was going backwards and forwards. No food, no toilets. The stench, the smell when I think about it. How can you treat people like that? What were, we were worse than animals. I don't know how long we were traveling. Excuse me. Till the train stopped. It was in the night. And two girls were there. I was in a terrible state to be truthful. I was being sick here and there because I was so worried over my mother. There were two young women there. And they were holding me from both sides. As we were going through the gate, which I didn't know where I was. I never, ex I never knew Auschwitz existed. As I was going in there, putting sugar into my mouth, the two girls, they were feeling sorry for me. And I got through. Mengele, this doctor, who was, your life, re rely on him. Look, took my hand like that, and the back, and threw me on the, to the right. I still don't know where I was. I did not know what it's all about. They put us in fives, and we walking and walking and walking. Till we got to a place, because that was Auschwitz, but they took us to Birkenau. I didn't even know what Birkenau is, what Auschwitz is. I never heard about it. When you got there, the chimney, the smell, the fire coming from the chimney, and the smell. Where are we? Where were we? When it was getting a bit lighter, I could see there are wooden blocks surrounded with electrifying wires, and from one block a woman came out. No hair, no shoes, very short dress, so I thought maybe that was a block where women are mentally ill, not thinking that in one hour or two hours I look exactly the same. We were walking, 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 till the end, it was daylight, the sun was shining already, they, they didn't put that inside anywhere. Oh, wait a minute, how did, yes. Who was it first? I'm getting a little bit muddled up. Um, no, they took us first to a very, very big room. Very, very big room and told us to undress ourselves. We didn't want to undress ourselves. We never been undressed in front of men. So they start beating up and we have to undress ourselves and put the clothes on the side. We had to walk like one behind each other in a circle and from there they were still taking out women who were thin, they had boils on them, out, taking them out. And then we knew afterwards they were taking them out to the, to the guest chambers. I, from hunger, was swollen. And that was my luck. People from hunger used to get thin, and I got swollen. And it was my very big luck because I look bloated up, I look good. Mm -hmm. So every time Mengele was coming to, to check us, I was getting through. Anyway, from there, after they marched us na naked, uh, without shoes, without anything, the feet were bleeding, and they put us in a little in cabins where they shaved us everywhere and, and put a number on and had a shower and gave us a dress. And the dress, when you open the seam, was full of dead lies. And that's all. And then they took me in, again, in fives, we had to, to, to assemble in uh, fives in a row, into to sea lager, and I was block, in block 30. It was tough. 
the five girls to a bank. They didn't give us any blankets or anything. And we are lying like next to each other. And the next day you can see that one day a girl can be dead. And you get up sometimes in the morning and a girl was touching the electrifying vow as she couldn't take it and she killed herself. But somehow I was fighting. I was fighting with myself. I was only one thing was that I haven't got my mother. But for myself, I really, I fought for my mother, but now I didn't care what's going to happen to me anymore. And one of the girls, two blocks in the Lager Sea, the front blocks, men used to come to work. And one of the girls says to me, Barbara, you know, your cousin from Lubranis, friend, comes to this, work, to this block to work. Why don't you sneak out? and go, maybe he'll help you. You were not allowed to go out from the block unless they took it to so-called toilet once a day. But I said to myself, what am I going to lose? So they kill me, I don't care anymore. I sneaked out next to this block where the men were working and I was calling his name. He was not there, his name was Henek Kluski. His brother was there. So he came out. I said, oh my God, you here? I said, yes, I'm here. I would like to speak to Henrik. So I, she, he said to me, what block are you in? I told him, what block am I in? The next day, Henrik came with a loaf of bread and clothes. An overall, a scarf on my head, his big socks, and, and, um, and, um, um, the, uh, the Dutch clocks, the wooden clocks. So I was already dressed and I looked like a Stibendienst, like a cleaner. So I could move from one place to another. Let's say if Benkele came to third block 30 and I heard, I didn't go in anymore there. I got another block. Anyway, in the end I landed up in block 31 because it was not possible anymore to to live there, to be trust for you. It, when I said to my friend Bella, who, whom I met, we, we, we knew each other from the Lodge Gate and then we met in Auschwitz. And I said to Bella, when Mengele comes, I'm going because I can't take it anymore. It's enough, it's enough. So I, a few days, a few weeks later, Mengele comes. In the middle of the block, you had a chimney, which was never lit about so high and when it was now some noises or something so the blocker tested the couple used to come in a beautiful nightgown and give us what for beating us or whatever and so we had to go on once a, we had to go all the thousand women on one side of the chimney Mengele stayed with two assessment in the gate where you come in and out and he, one by one, we had to undress ourselves, of course, we, but we're holding the clothes on our arms. One by one, one girl goes on the other side of the block, or one girl goes out. Now, you do, do not know which one is good, which one is going to be alive, the one which is on the, because that time I knew already what's going on. If the girl which goes on the other side of the block is going to be safe or the one which is outside. Anyway, from there they put us again in fives and they took us to a place where is a shower. Now, is it a shower or is it gas? So we're holding ourselves like, you know, stiff, praying to God. What is it going to come out, shower or gas? You see, shower came out because if it would be gas, I wouldn't be here. You have no idea how we felt, how we cried and kissed each other. From there, they took us to a place where they gave us clothes. And the woman who was giving me clothes, she says to me, you're very lucky, you're going to work. They put us not in, in a 
um, cattle tracks, the wagons, but the proper trains. And they took us to a farm where we lived in, a, it was a very big farm, in b barns. I was put in the barn where the cows were living, but you had an oven. And we had to go to work, walking quite a long way. We, they put us in hundreds. There were 200 Polish Jewesses and 800 Hungarian Jewesses. And we were walking to a place where we had, between Polish and German border, where we had to dig ditches, anti-tank ditches. It was hard work, very hard work. We didn't have the strength to pick up even the, the shovel. Anyway, we had to do it, we had to do it. And when we used to come in the evening back, at least it was clean already. We had a, um, out in, in the yard, we have a um, water pump. We could wash ourselves and take the water inside and wash ourselves. We had straw and every one of us got a blanket. So one blanket we put underneath and then one blanket. I was with Bella, so we shared like two sisters we were. And I had a very good voice. And that time when that Henny came to visit me and bring me the clothes, he also introduced me to the local tester and he told her that I can sing. So she used to make parties there and wake me up in the night. I was singing and they were dancing and then I, when they put, went into another room I put food wherever I could and to give to the other girls when I went back to the block. And that's how I was surviving as well. Then, can you switch off for one second, please? And us, men were working. They had to finish the, the ditches in a proper way because the Germans were so perfect with everything. One day, from thousand women, a man was throwing me bread and tobacco. And for this tobacco, I was getting soup, sharing everything with Bella. From thousand, I, I must say, I was a very pretty woman, pretty girl. From thousand women, it was going like that for about a month. Then he threw me a letter. I should stand there and there because he was, what was he doing? He was carrying wood. He had a horse and a wagon. He was writing to me Polish. I should stand there and he will save me. I should, he puts me into the wood and get me out from there. I didn't know who he was, if he was Jewish or not. How did I know who he was? I didn't go. And I didn't go, but he still helped me. And that was, I must tell you something, God was me and I was very unlucky. In unluck, I had some bit of luck. This man saved my life with the food and those was working so hard. We had to, it was one and a half deeper than this room. We had to throw the earth up. That's why, unfortunately, I'll tell you afterwards, what well, I've got trouble here. Anyway. And then, one night they woke us up in the night and the ill girls we had to carry in the, in the blankets because they couldn't walk. And believe you me, it was tough because we didn't have the strength to do it. We were passing a um, forest, so we got into the forest, they put the girls into the, the ill girls into the wagon and we were pushing the wagon. That didn't last long, and about two, three weeks later, again to the forest, they, told, they took the girls, the ill girls out, and they shot them. Uh, you know, you just say like that, like it's nothing. Do you know, it's impossible how I, I'm saying it, and my heart is bleeding. Anyway, we were walking, they never gave us any food. 
we're living only on snow. In the night, we are sleeping in barns. One night, a barn was in the wood, in the wood, in, in the forest, sorry, in forest. And there were um, things buried in earth, like, because I remember they were doing this in Poland, during the frost they buried vegetables and potatoes for the winter. So I thought this is a fantastic place to, 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 to hide. And the, the forest, the barn was from wood and they had spaces between wood. And I was the youngest one, so the girl said to me, the woman, we help you to, 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 to make a hole in the wood, in the straw, and we cover you. Because this is a fantastic place to, to save yourself. So, I could hear, I did, and you see, they used to only check with the bayonets, and the bayonets were not so deep as I was. And they left him, but I could hear crying on the other side of the barn. The girl, the woman, she was a woman, she had a child whom they took away from her hand when she went to Auschwitz, Irma. She couldn't walk anymore. And she said to me, look, that was the, the marching, that was de called death, death march. Whoever fell in the end, they killed it, you see. And so Irma was saying, look, kill me here, what, I can't walk, kill me here. But she was like it was a gendarme, not an assessment, and he left her. So in the night I went over to her, then I went outside with my bare hands, <laughs> about three inches deep, frozen earth, with my bare hands, I got into the, to the, to the potatoes, there were potatoes there. And we lived on 11 days, days for raw potatoes with snow. So the owner came and the dog was barking so long that we had to come down. And they arrested us. And it, look, it is a very long story. Not so much any more interesting, but they arrested us and they were taken to the next town. And the town was down below and suddenly aeroplanes came and the town is on fire. So the two gendarmes were with us, they left us in the middle and ran away. We went back, uh, as we are passing there we could smell in the village, but potatoes being cooked for, for the animals. We could smell the potatoes and we knew that a lot of poles were working there. So I went, we went in and they, they gave us potatoes to put everywhere and we thought we go back to the barn. Now we've got cooked potatoes with snow. We can still live for another 11 days because we could hear bombing and shooting, but the Russians didn't have the order to come over the Odra, the, the mm. river, Odra. Mm. And that's why they're standing there and we are suffering. Anyway, to cut this story short, because I forgot to tell you, a woman, when we were going from the barn, a woman was standing there near the fence, a German woman, so I, and Myrna, Irma spoke very well Germans because they came from Germany. So I said, ask her for some water. So she asked for the water, the woman went in and she never come back. And when we went to this place where they were getting the potatoes, two gendarmes came and they arrested us again. It was arresting from one place to another, from one place to another, till one gendarme says to us, who are we? He didn't know who we are. So we looked at each other, we said, we are Poles, we are on the Polish-German border. And, and they, the Russians were coming, we didn't want to be freed by the Russians, so we ran away. And he left us in the middle of the town, and you see the Germans were running away from there because they didn't want to be freed by the Russians. They wanted to be freed by the Americans and English. So he left us, we went to a house, we took some clothes, 
We dress ourselves with fafans and money. We went to a town called Lieben because she knew more about Germany because they were, they were living in Germany, but they originated from Poland, so they sent back them to Poland, Irma's family. And we went to the labor, labor exchange there and we got work on a farm. We were six weeks in the farm and it was the 8th of May, the Russians came. And that's how we were liberated. The Russians came. They, it was also very difficult with Russians because they were raping women as well. It was not so, believe me, it was not easy. And we saw them, the, the number. Actually, the colonel was Jewish. That's what I could understand. He told us, look, you take a, go to the Germans, take yourself close. Do you a suitcase, your suitcase, we give you the cart and the horse and go back home. And so we did. But by the time we got to Poland, the Russians stripped us of everything as well. It was tough, all the way tough, till we got to a town called Lignica, which was Germany before now is Poland. It's not far from Breslau, Lignica. And I was working there in the town hall, and one day um, reporters came from England there, and I had an interview because I was working there. And uh, I told him that I have family here. My father's oldest brother came to England before the First World War, and after the First World War he brought over his parents, my grandparents, and uh, my father's sister with the family. He put me in the newspapers, I remember the surnames, and I remember NW10, NW11, and 10, and, and, uh, and W10, W11. I remember this, but I don't, didn't remember anything else. And he put me in the telegraph, I think, and the family saw it and they got in touch with me, and that's how I come to England. In England, I was staying with them for a year, and then I was staying with my bubba, my grand grandmother. My grandfather died when he had how many sons he lost in Poland and in France, so he had a heart attack. But I was staying with bubba for a year, and then I was introduced to my husband. My husband came also from Poland. Um, he was in, he ran to Russia when the Germans came, and there he joined the Polish army under the British command. Unfortunately, he went through also a lot, but he had typhoid and he had to get into the army. Twice he went there to, to be, um, how do you call it, to be installed to the army. Mm -hmm. How do you call it? Eh? And as a Jew, they wouldn't take him. And the next day he went, as a Jew, they wouldn't take him again. So the third time, eh, he went as a Christian changed his surname, papers they didn't have anyway, as long as they didn't tell him to take off the trousers. <laughs> and he was in the army for six years as a guy, as a, as a Christian. And believe you me, that was very, very tough. Very, very tough. Because you know how the Poles talking about the Jews and you have to keep stum nothing. But some of them did expect that he was Jewish. Because whatever happens, they were, they were in Italy, let's say, stationed in Italy. Who was first to speak in, in Italian? My husband. He, fall, he never was a mechanic, become a mechanic, repairing the, the jeeps, the lorries, and had hundred people under him. So some of them did thought something is there. And as he was staying on a, um, on the, oh, in the night when they have to stay in, uh, with the with the gun. On duty. On duty. One of the Poles came over to me. You are a bloody, not bloody, whatever Jew you are in Polish, he said. And I will finish you off the war. And he couldn't say anything because he was on duty and he thought to myself, you finish me off, I finish you off before. The next day, he and another man, this Paul, went to get catch some chickens 
because it was not far from the border, and they killed him. So God gave him what for. And my husband, when we come back here, came back to, came to England with the army, he got himself a job in a, his father was a, a tailor, but he was not a tailor, but he was a very clever man, my husband. Very, everything, what the eyes saw, the hands were doing. And, and he got in a, in a factory, and here in a factory you only had to do one thing, you don't have to do her garment, or they put sleeves in, or a collar in, and he learned very quickly. And I was working also in effect. I was not allowed to work. I came to England. My uncle guaranteed for me I came under age. I was not, but I did. My friend found me a job because I needed some money and all this. And there where the girl was working, another lady was working, or her husband also was Polish, Jewish, from the army. They met my husband by their friends and they introduced me to him. And, and after, you know, we got married. Um, we got married and we, were, we had a very tough time. We didn't have no money. He had 28 pounds, the mob money. My grandfather, before he died, he left me 100 pounds. That was put in the post office and I wouldn't touch it. So we didn't have anything, but eventually we were living in a horrible place in the East End, in a hovel, to be truthful with you, and then I got pregnant and I had to get out as quick as possible from there with the prostitutes and, and old thieves and God only knows, because it was not far from the, um, where the ships come in. Near the docks. Yes, near mm -hmm. the... Near the um, Near the what? Docks. Docks. Box? Docks. Docks. That's yeah. right. Near the docks. I keep, I keep forgetting. It's terrible. Near the docks. And um, eventually he got more because it was funny when he, he, he saw me only three times. And he says, I would like to engage to you, but I only earn four pounds five a week. It's mm -hmm. not enough to keep a wife. So I said, I earn four pounds, a new pound, four pounds, five, four, eight pounds we can live. And they've done it. So we got engaged for his, the mob money, 28 pounds. We got a, a, a ring for 23 pounds and, um, and um, worked very, very hard. He got a better job, become a better tailor. And he was earning only seven pounds 50. And um, we got, we paid key money in, in West Hampstead. It sounds beautiful, but I'll tell you where it was. Little flat, which, where is Kilburn, Maida Vale, and West Hampstead, the corner there. But that place belonged to West Hampstead. The my husband was always laughing. Why did you say it was Kilburn? I said, but it was West Hampstead. It was, <laughs> why should I say Kilburn? <laughs> anyway, and, um, mm -hmm. and slowly, I had a son, mm. and the son, unfortunately, is very ill, has a mess, sitting on the chair there, on the wheelchair. Can you see? Mm. You can't see it. Mm. Anyway, so that was, my life is not better as with roses. And then I had, six years later, I have a little boy again. And this one is also not so perfect. His nerves are very bad. And, um, but my husband was a fantastic man. Mm. Fantastic is not enough. Understanding in every way. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I'll show you the photos inside when we come in. Mm. He was a very, very good man. God gave me one as my husband. And now, my, this son, who is so ill, has two children. My grandchildren were looked after my husband when he was ill. Now they're looking after me, but it's very difficult for them because they've got an ill father. They've got to look after the ill father. I don't know if do you know the place is Golders Green, Rella Gold Hill? It's in Golders Green, Lambs Avenue. Where it was Sobo, place was Lambs Avenue. There, he's in a Jewish, Jewish, uh, nice, from place, 
because my grandchildren are, are a little bit from. I mean, I keep a kosher home. I am in my heart a Jew, but not a strict mm -hmm. Jew. But in my heart, I'm a Jew. And as my husband said, as long as you're a good person, this is more important than anything else. We believe very much in Israel. Our life was Israel. My husband's whole family, two sisters survived as well. And a lot of um, family came from in 36 from Germany. They, his family was living in Germany. And they, so I have a big family. I had a big family in Israel and twice a year we are going to Israel. As a matter of fact, I slept myself last year, last year for Sukkot. Because there when my husband died, the nieces and nephews came to the funeral. They all came. They give me very big respect. And so I go to my niece, stayed with my niece, and she looked after me because I can't look after myself completely now. But that was the last time. The journey really killed me. I can't take it anymore. So they're very upset. One of the sisters, my husband's sisters, live in in Katsrim. This is in Syria, near Syria, in the Golan Heights. And she was always looking forward when I'm coming. And because of her, I wish I could go because she's really broken hearted and uh, lost a daughter when she was very young, 44 of cancer. She's really, I'm so sorry that I can't, I phone them all the time. And that's so, and um, we worked very hard and I'm not short of anything, thank God. I can keep my little bungalow and uh, I even drive only locally. I wouldn't try to f go further because my health is not so all right. I get very quickly tired. So I can go to, 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 to my kosher deli in Edgeware I go, and to Sainsbury's I go, and to Yossi's, to the baker's. This I can manage. And I don't have to have anybody to help me. If the weather is nice and I am rested, so I can drive. Today I couldn't drive because after yesterday it was too emotional and too ma many hours I get very quickly tired. And my grandchildren, bless him, my grandson got married two years ago and he's got two children. So I'm a great grandmother. When you, when you get up maybe you can see it. The love of, see, I lost two bulbs, I can see, that's why I have no light. Wait a minute, if I put it here, will it work? 